A very warm welcome to Hollywell Music Room this evening. We're delighted that you can join us for a wonderful program of music and poetry, all under the banner of New Beginnings, a program that we've created especially for you to thank you, our donors all over the world, for your support in the year past. Despite your own personal hardship, you've all stood by the Wadham community and you've supported the college with your donations of all sizes, but also with your messages of hope and of humor and of kindness. And tonight is a program designed for you to thank you and to show our appreciation. With help from our two wonderful Wadham poets and from our stellar pianists and singers, um, we've created a program um, that will focus on the new beginnings we hope are ahead of us and embrace the vulnerability, the hope, the vitality and the joy that new beginnings will bring. We would of course much rather have welcomed you here in person in Hollywell or indeed in the Fellows Garden for our annual Benefactors Garden Party. But for now, let's imagine that you're all with us here in person um, and we really look forward to sharing the music and the words uh, from a place that you all know so well. I'm particularly pleased this evening to welcome the warden, Ken McDonnell, as he hosts his last alumni event of his incredibly industrious and successful nine-year tenure. I know he's looking forward to thanking you all and to welcoming you back virtually to Hollywell. Well, um, thanks, Julie. Thank you very much for those, those kind words. And obviously, we would normally, as Julie says, be welcoming you into the, the gardens, the Fellows Garden uh, in particular, for, for what is usually a sun-splashed and very happy event. The last few years, the weather has been absolutely wonderful, and it's always um, particularly nice to see people from across so many generations. We often have alumni in their 80s and even 90s attending, as well as more recent alumni and we've really missed enormously over the last 18 months seeing you um, in, in college. It's been one of the great uh, privations of the pandemic for us that, that our friends and supporters have been unable to visit but that's going to change I think uh, in the coming months and hopefully from the autumn um, and hopefully next year there will be again a benefactors garden party and there'll be Gordies in Hall and, and you'll have every opportunity to return to this place to a very, very warm welcome. Um, as I've said to you many times on the last, during the last nine years, the college is completely dependent um, on the sport that you have so generously uh, given us, uh, and so regularly and, and with such warmth uh, and kindness, particularly over the last 18 months, which have been a struggle for so many of us, and I know for so many of you, you seem to have, if anything, redoubled your efforts and redoubled your support for the college and that has been immensely touching for all of us, for everyone here, the, the, the fellows, the staff uh, and the students. We've all been immensely touched by your friendship um, and your support and your expressions of concern uh, and goodwill. I, I think we've come through the pandemic so far in pretty good shape. It's obviously been difficult uh, in many respects. The students have missed a lot of face-to-face -face teaching and a lot of socialising. Many of our staff have been furloughed uh, and our, our academics have been conducting the bulk of their teaching uh, online, which has been a strange experience, um, but which I suppose everyone has now become used to. It, it's my personal hope that we can get back to as much face-to-face -face teaching as possible um, in, in the next months. I think it's such an important part of the experience of our students to be meeting with their tutors, their lecturers, with the academics um, in person. The, the college, I think, can, can look forward to the next period uh, with confidence. Its finances are in reasonably good shape. We've taken a bit of a hit, but we've been careful and we've husbanded our resources. Academically, we're flying very high. The college was placed sixth in this year's Norrington table, so our finalists have done remarkably well in the face of all of the difficulties that they've faced. Uh, and we've supported um, one another. We remain an inclusive, uh, a caring, independent, and I hope progressive community uh, of individuals respecting one another, uh, looking out for one another, supporting one another. 
and that's what you support when you support this college. So thank you. Thank you for your friendship um, over the last few years. Uh, I, I know that it will continue, and I do look forward to seeing many of you um, in, in the months uh, and years ahead. We've got a wonderful program for you this evening, as um, uh, Julie has said, uh, and I'm going to start by introducing uh, Eric Clark, Professor Clark, who's the uh, Professor of Music in the University, a professorial fellow here uh, at uh, Wadham. Um, I've become immensely fond of Eric over the years, and we've spent a lot of time together speaking uh, about music, um, which he obviously knows a lot about and I know a little less about, but which I enjoy very much. And Eric has an extraordinarily eclectic taste. The first music occasion I attended at Wadham, um, where people turn up and play music of their choice, he chose A Day in the Life by the Beatles. I thought that was very interesting and um, refreshing, obviously a good piece of music as well. But Eric, it's a pleasure to welcome you here, and, and thank you for what you've done to put this evening together. Well, thanks very much, Ken, for those very kind words. And um, it is a great pleasure to be here in the Hollywood Music Room to witness some live music and live poetry, of which we have had, sadly, too little over the last um, 15 months. And actually, the Hollywell Music Room is a particularly appropriate place for a, a program entitled New Beginnings, because as many of you will know, the Hollywell Music Room is the oldest um, purpose-built music room still in operation as a concert venue in Europe and possibly in the world. And in a sense, it represented a dramatic new beginning for music, to make music available to a public who were not part of a court or a church or some elite group, but to make music publicly available. It is, in a sense, um, you might say, Wadham's first access centre, but access to music being the most important thing here. So we have a wonderful programme of music ranging across three centuries, from the 18th to the 21st um, centuries, um, starting off with some music by Haydn. Haydn's own relationship with the Hollywell Music Room is a slightly checkered one, actually. Um, it, it, it's reported that he was invited to come and play the harpsichord in the Hollywell Music Room in May of 1791, the year of Mozart's death, of course. And uh, he fully intended to come, but on the day that he was supposed to come here and make and do that recital, he actually uh, was, unfortunately, had to go and conduct an opera rehearsal at Covent Garden, and so failed to turn up to his uh, concert here in May. Haydn was, at that stage, an absolute kind of pop star celebrity in this country. He was um, putting on concerts in London that were kind of, you know, people were... were Crowds of people were trying to get to hear his music. So his failure to turn up in the Hollywell was actually taken rather amiss. And it, he was, in the end, he published a public apology in the Oxford Journal in, uh, I think, May, the same month of 1791, apologizing for having failed to turn up to his uh, concert. It can't be many places that have had a public apology from Haydn, I think. Um, he came to Oxford two months later, though, in July of 1791, to receive an honorary degree at which which he then performed his 92nd symphony, so-called the Oxford Symphony, in the Sheldonian Theatre, not quite in the Hollywell, but it is reported in John Mee's excellent book of 1911, The History of the Hollywell Music Room, it's reported that he almost certainly rehearsed it in the Hollywell Music Room. So I think we can claim that, that Haydn probably was here rehearsing his symphony. Um, so let me introduce now the three musicians who are going to... Um, provide this wonderful musical uh, feast today. Helen Charleston, the mezzo-soprano, was winner of the London Handel competition in 2018 and was a founding participant in a program called The Rising Stars of the Enlightenment, which is an, a, a, a program in which singers uh, sing with the orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment. Again, actually appropriate to the Hollywell Music Room, which is an Enlightenment building, of course. Um, working alongside the Orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment, and she will be singing the role of Rosmira in Handel's uh, opera Partenope in a tour across uh, Europe. Alice, Alessandro Fischer, um, the tenor, was winner of the first prize at the 2016 Kathleen Ferrier Awards and is an associate artist of the Mozartists. 
He read uh, modern and medieval languages at Cambridge, where he was a choral scholar at Clare College and went on to further vocal studies at the Guildhall School of Music and Drama in London. And last but not least, Sholto Kainoch, um, the pianist, who is the founder and artistic director of the Oxford Leader Festival, um, founded in 2002, so it's just coming up to its 20th anniversary. Uh, Sholto, we are proud in the music faculty to say, was a graduate of, the, uh, of Oxford's music faculty. Um, he graduated from Worcester in 2001, so within a year of graduating, he had set up what has now become one of the most celebrated international leader festivals in the world. Um, he won, uh, and the, the, the festival itself won the prestigious Royal Philharmonic si uh, um, Award in 2015, praised for the breadth, depth, and audacity of its programming. Um, in addition, he is the pianist in the Phoenix Piano Trio, again, with new beginnings, Phoenix rising from the ashes is very appropriate, it seems to me, um, and is, as we will hear in a minute, a fantastic solo, solo pianist in his own right. So, um, over to the musicians. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Thank you. Um, it's now my great pleasure, my enormous pleasure, to, to introduce Bernard O'Donoghue. 
Um, it was my misfortune that Bernard retired as a tutorial fellow um, at Wadham the very, the very time that I arrived, although I, don't, I hope the two weren't connected. Um, <laughs> nevertheless, it's been an enormous pleasure getting to know Bernard as an emeritus fellow uh, of the college, a much-loved emeritus fellow, as he was a much-loved tutorial fellow in English for so many of years, years. and some of you may have been students um, uh, of Bernard's, and if so, I think you were very, very fortunate. As well as being uh, an academic, uh, Bernard is a, a poet, uh, and an extraordinarily good poet of, of, of wide renown. He, he won the Whitbread, Whitbread Prize in 1995 for his collection, Gunpowder, uh, and he won the Chumley Prize uh, some years later, and was on many occasions shortlisted for the T.S. Eliot Prize. In 1999, uh, he was uh, elected a Fellow of the Royal Society of Literature, and in 2014, he succeeded Seamus uh, Heaney as Honorary President of the Irish Literary Society uh, of London. Bernard, thank you so much for being with us um, this evening. I think you're going to read, read us three of your poems. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ken. I'm, I'm very grateful and honoured for that uh, um, introduction. <clears throat> it's been a great pleasure to be here and still hanging around while you were here. So, um, <clears throat> I write mostly about, about Ireland, which is a, a, a kind of a, a failing that Irish people abroad tend to have. Um, and the first, the first poem I'm going to read has some connection with, um, with this area, because um, uh, um, about uh, 30 years ago, I met a woman, a nun from the Aran Islands off the west of Ireland. She'd worked all her life as a, as a cook in, um, uh, in a student hostel near Newbury in Berkshire. So she was, um, she was connected with this area too. But she told me just in passing that the day she entered the convent, she was then in her 70s, but the day she entered the convent when she was about 12 or 13, she saw a car, a motor car, for the first time in her life. And then, of course, she went into the convent and didn't see one again for 40 years, effectively. Um, so it seemed an extraordinary moment of, uh, of an encounter of, of two worlds. So it is a kind of new beginning or new departure, really. <clears throat> a nun takes the veil. That morning early, I ran through briars to catch the calves that were bound for market. I stopped the once to watch the sun rising over Doolin across the water. The cows were tethered outside the house when I had my breakfast, the last one at home for 40 years. I had what I wanted, they said I could, so we'd loaf bread and marry biscuits. We strung the cows behind the boat, me keeping clear to protect my style, my confirmation suit and my patent sandals. But I trailed my fingers in the cool green water, watching the puffins driving homeward to their nests on Arran. On the Galway mainland, I tiptoed clear of the cow dung slipway and watched my brothers heaving the calves as they lost their footing. We went in a trap, myself and my mother, and I said goodbye to my father then. <clears throat> the last I saw of him was a hat and jacket and a sally stick driving cattle to Ballyvohan. He died, they told me, in the county home, asking to see me. But that was later. As we trotted on through the morning mist, I saw a car for the first time ever, hardly seeing it before it vanished. I couldn't believe it, and I stood up looking to where I could hear its noise departing, but it was only a glimpse. That night in the convent, the sisters spoilt me, but I couldn't forget the morning's vision, and I fell asleep with the engine humming through the open window. I'll just read one more, actually, because then... By the time I've finished introducing them, it's like an extra poem, really. So, <clears throat> this, uh, this is also in, in a sort of uh, in a female context, really. Um, when I was growing up in, in County Cork, um, there was a friend of my mother's uh, uh, called Dolly Duggan, who um, was a great, she was great fun. Um, but she was a wonderful, again, a wonderful mixture of the sort of, se of the secular and the spiritual, really. That she was a great drinker of red wine and she smoked an awful lot of cigarettes, which finally um, caught up with her. But um, uh, she was a daily mass goer. So you've got that curious mixture, um, quite common, I think, in, in, in Ireland. Um, and if you had an exam coming or something like that, um, 
she, she would say, don't worry about it, I'll light a candle for you. So you knew that while you were slaving away at physics or whatever it was, you know, that Dolly's candle was there representing you with the higher authorities uh, in, the, in the church. So um, she died, as I said, she died quite young, but um, since after she died, I went around, around Europe, really, going to various um, um, church places, lighting candles for her. A candle for Dolly Duggan. Improbabilities, of course, we all know that. That this graceful taper I force into the tallowed cast iron beneath the assumption in the Fraudi could change the heavens so that she can pick up her cigarettes and lighter to move on to a higher circle as before she moved talking through the lanes of Cork. Sir Thomas Brown said, there aren't impossibilities enough in religion for an active faith. So I'll go on spending liras and francs and pesetas across the smoky hush of Catholic Europe until she says, that's enough. And then I'm free to toast her in red wine outside in the sunlit squares. Well, what, um, what amazing poems, I must say. And uh, I can't say what a huge pleasure it is to be in the same room with uh, Bernard again. Um, as it happens, when I um, came to Oxford to interview for the post of Heather Professor and was brought to Wadham to see the college that I would become a member of were I to be appointed, it was Bernard who was, had been um, given the task of um, showing me around the college. And if I had had any doubts at all, which I didn't actually, about whether I wanted to be associated with that college, they were utterly and completely dispelled by um, the wonderful person that um, Bernard is. So it's great to be here again. The second segment of music then that we're going to hear is um, a set of three songs by Clara Schumann. So Clara Schumann was um, arguably one of the most important figures in 19th century music. She lived for most of the 19th century and was an incredibly um, important and very celebrated pianist who basically defined the piano recital as we know it today. She it was who turned it from being a kind of display of often quite unimportant and rather insignificant pieces of virtuoso music into the rather serious collection of um, significant music that the piano recital became and has been really for the last 150 years, I guess. And it was she also who, um, who really brought into being that, that tradition which we now have of playing music, um, by, not everyone actually, but by, of playing music by memory in recitals. Until that point, people didn't really bother with memorizing music. So she was an incredibly important um, pianist, but of course she was also an incredibly important um, composer. Um, so, Clara Wieck, as she was by her birth name, who and then married uh, Robert Schumann, um, produced a great deal of piano music, um, and uh, as you would expect of a pianist, and also a significant, very significant body of um, songs with piano accompaniment. And it is uh, three of those songs that we're going to hear in a minute. And I suppose Clara Schumann, as a woman composer, is one of perhaps three composers who have led the vanguard of the recognition, the all too slow and shamefully uh, slow recognition of the achievements of women composers. I suppose Clara Schumann, Fanny Mendelssohn, and perhaps Ethel Smythe, who lived into the 20th century, are perhaps the three women who we have become most well acquainted with um, from that, that period. So we're going to hear um, three of those uh, songs that uh, Clara um, composed. Uh, which start with the evening and end with the morning.
Poetry is in very good heart in Wadham these days, and uh, our next reader, Ruth Thrush, is a very important part of that, an explanation for it. She's now approaching the final year of her degree in English. Her work has been published in various Oxford-based publications, including Charwell, the Oxford Public Philosophy Journal, and the journal The Fleet, where she is resident poet. Along with three of her peers, she runs the Wadham Poetry Collective, a group of Wadhamites who meet regularly to practice poetry in all its configurations, writing, reading, listening and publishing. Ruth also runs the Oxford Feminist Society and spends a lot of time practicing ballet and playing her cello. So politics, movement and music all greatly inform and direct her writing. Ruth Thrush. Thank you very much, Bernard. Um, it's really special to be able to be here today and to share some poems with you all um, because it's really kind of in and because of Wadham and its community um, that I have discovered the joys of writing poetry um, and learned so much about writing poetry as well. So thank you and um, I hope you enjoy these poems. The first poem that I'm going to read is called The Poem Which Does Not Begin But Is Exposed. Mornings are not made for pretense. They are not voyeurs either, but they are concerned with nakedness or a bareness that tends to embarrass. And because they are cruel in this way, they watch our fingers as they point to each glowing fragment of last night's dream, one that floats on the mirrored steam of the kettle, one that stitches its initials into clothes that can withstand the day and the one that shades the shadow of the fig tree. The belief that in a beginning is an end is a dangerous belief, and not so much belief as artifice. I am sure that the mother who wakes in the small hours will tell you as much, she who has experienced childbirth and an intimacy with days, for the sun and the wet postnatal head do not begin clean, as fruit does not begin as language does not begin, as there is no telos and no origin, and any fantasy of such is a violence. And in peace, there is exposure, the release from slumber, the fresh speech of she who dreamt of demanding newness, but could not find the words. So as Bernard mentioned, um, I play the cello and because of lockdown restrictions this year, I've spent a lot of time playing chamber music um, and I've actually ended up spending a lot of time playing hide and string quartets for which the cello part often consists of playing lots and lots of repeated notes. Um, and I think this practice of playing lots of Haydn has really made me think a lot about repetition, specifically about the purpose of repetition in everyday life and how daily acts of repetition might work in periods of heightened uncertainty or restriction. I've also been thinking a lot, perhaps more in line with this evening's theme and in time with um, the gradual easing of restrictions. Um, I've been thinking about how we might begin from repetition and how we might find something new in or against that which is repeated. Um, 
So this next poem, I think, condenses some of my thoughts about repetition, poetry, music, and new beginnings. And this is called Sonata Form. Today the sun rises, tonight the sun sets. Tomorrow the sun will rise, and the sun will set tomorrow night. Repeat. Yesterday the poet wrote a sonnet, and today she writes another. Repeat. Through squinted eyes, she looks up to a metre other than her own. It is the sun's units and the poet's problem, a measure that is not linear, a circle that has already happened. Today the sun rises, tonight the sun sets, repeat. Instead of recapitulation, she looks first for a gap and then for the next movement. The final poem that I'm going to read is a poem that I wrote when I was on holiday last summer in Cornwall, staying in a cottage that looked out over the sea. Um, and I suppose this might be a poem about the ways in which the sea manages to break out of its own patterns and is a model for finding new ways of beginning. And this is called Waters, which do not recover themselves do not set roots under time, which flap between language and sound and cannot be translated, or pulled neatly without eating and eating. Waters which do not lie on their backs and give away their secrets of plurality. Waters whose crashing is only the beginning of their madness. Waters which are clean of ours. Only memory can scrape the seabed and feel relief, or avoid the shadows or dive and make holes, certain to return to a whiteness, gasping and gasping. Thank you. Well, as we come to the final group of songs in this evening's event, I'm reminded of what an absolutely wonderful place this is to perform in the Hollywood Music Room Thank you, Ken, Eric, and Julie, for having us here this evening. It's fantastic that Oxford Leader has such a strong association with this space and also, of course, therefore, with Wadham College. Our last four songs are in the 20th and, indeed, the 21st century. The first one, On His Blindness, by Stephen Bick, was commissioned by Helen, who's about to sing it for you, uh, last year as part of her isolation songbook project. She commissioned during uh, lockdown 15 composers to write new works in response to their experiences of the pandemic. And it's not all gloomy. There's a lot of very uplifting work in there as well, an extraordinary range of responses. It's been recently been recorded to great acclaim. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that Helen will be returning to the Oxford Leader Festival this October to perform selections of the isolation songbook for us. We're then going to perform a lullaby by Shostakovich. Uh, Helen, in fact, performed this in this very space at Oxford Leader's online spring weekend earlier this year when she was illustrating a fascinating lecture given by Professor Philip Bullock, a fellow in Russian at Wadham College, of course, uh, when he was talking about the Russian thaw and music following the death of Stalin. And then Alessandro and Helen will finish with two amazing songs, one a duet by the ultra-lyrical Anglo-Italian composer Paolo Tosti.
Well, thank you all um, so much, uh, Sholto, Helen, uh, and Alessandro. Thank you, thank you for putting together such a wonderful program and performing it so beautifully for us. Um, a wonderful evening. And, and thank you, um, Ruth, for your wonderful poems. Thank you for reading them to us. And Bernard, of course, thank you as well for yours. Um, it's been an enormous pleasure listening to that poetry. Um, thank you for uh, watching this evening. Um, we hope you have a, a, a good summer. Um, and that next year we'll be able to welcome you, as I said earlier, in person 
to a, a, a more traditional um, garden party, um, and, and we look forward to that um, hugely. Uh, before I finish, I'd like to also thank Julie and uh, Rachel and Marco and Salome and the whole development office team um, for all the work they've done um, putting this together. And Tamara, my executive assistant, who's shaking her head, which suggests she hasn't done anything to contribute to this, but I'll thank, <laughs> thank her anyway for attending. Uh, thank you all very much for being here, um, if only virtually, and hopefully really here next year. Thank you.